It's a very significant time. This is the uh, 50th anniversary when Israel captured the old city of Jerusalem. Now, it's important to point that out. They didn't capture the whole city of Jerusalem because they actually already had half the city. Um, they already had the, the western half of the city. So it was the old city of Jerusalem that they captured. Now, um, so tonight we're going to point out the significance of this uh, remarkable event. And I hope you'll be able to see from our discussion tonight how wonderful the prophecies of the Bible have been fulfilled. Now, there's no doubt that Jerusalem is the most controversial city in the world. I don't think there's any other city anywhere in the world over which uh, there have been wars fought or uh, uh, skirmishes, disturbances, uh, UN resolutions, you name it. It is the most controversial city in the world. Before we get into the subject, I want to just point out to you what the Bible has to say about Jerusalem. So there's three quotations which tell us what God thinks of Jerusalem. First of all, in the second book of Chronicles, chapter 6, it tells us that God has chosen Jerusalem. So it must be a very important city in the eyes of God for God to choose it. And uh, not only has he chosen Jerusalem, but he's chosen, of course, um, the people of Israel. They are God's chosen people. Then Psalm 87 tells us that the Lord loves the gates of Zion, which is another name for Jerusalem, more than anything else in the world. And most telling, the psalm says that glorious things are spoken of the O city of God. So whatever we may think of Jerusalem, the fact is that it has a very, very bright future ahead of it. may not seem like the case now, but it certainly will be in the future. And then finally, Psalm 48, it says that it's beautiful for situation. Um, it may not look like that now, but the fact is that in the future, uh, the area where Jerusalem now is situated is going to be elevated, and uh, in that area, the temple of God will be built. It's called the joy of the whole earth. Well, you wouldn't call that now, would you? Uh, it's not the joy of the whole earth. It is a city over which there is much strife and tension. And lastly, it's described there as the city of the great king. Now, we know who that great king is. It's unquestionably Jesus Christ. He is the great king that's going to reign from Jerusalem. Now, a few facts about Jerusalem. Um, 3,000 years ago, um, it was the capital of Israel. It's been attacked 52 times, besieged 23 times, ransacked 39 times, destroyed and rebuilt three times, captured and recaptured 44 times. And yet, today, it is the capital of Israel. So after 3,000 years, it's still the capital of Israel. Now in that photograph there on the right, you'll see there the little circle with those names uh, uh, attached to it. Salem, Jebus, Jerusalem, the city of David. All of those titles were names given to that ancient area. You see, the modern city of Jerusalem um, occupies quite an extensive area. If you've ever been to that area, you'll know that Jerusalem is quite a large city. But in that little area there uh, designated by the circle, that was the original area of Jerusalem when it was captured by uh, King David's army and also when it became David's capital. That was the place from which David was the king. So it was only a small area, um, but that was the area that was occupied. Now let's jump forward about a thousand years from the time when King David reigned over Jerusalem. King David reigned over Jerusalem about BC 1000. Now we go forward to the birth of Jesus. So there's a map of the Roman Empire, and you'll notice there on the right hand side you've got the area of Palestine which is the area of modern-day Israel and Jordan and uh, a few other nations as well. It's interesting to note that in the time when Jesus was born, there were about 750,000 people living in Palestine. So it was a reasonable population. Not like today, there are, the population of Israel today would be around about 8 million. So it wasn't a huge city, but it was big enough. And... Uh, in Palestine, in Jerusalem, we had the temple. 
The temple was the central place of worship in the time when Jesus lived. And uh, by the time Jesus lived, Jerusalem was quite a reasonable sized city. For many uh, months before Jesus died, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the people, had gradually turned against him. Initially, the people, the Jewish people, were very happy with what Jesus was telling them, but then gradually they started to lose interest, and the Jewish leaders, the priests in particular, they were very antagonistic towards Jesus, to the extent that Jesus uttered more than one warning to the Jewish people that because they had rejected him as son of God, because they had rejected him as their future king, then times of trouble were in store for them. So here's on the left-hand side a prophecy from Matthew where Jesus is talking to the Jewish people and in particular their city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You who kill the prophets and stone those who sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. So he's depicting himself as a mother hen. And he says to the Jewish people, I would love to gather you under my wings and to tell you about God, to tell you about the Bible, to tell you about the promises made to the Jewish people. But you wouldn't listen to me. You didn't want me. And as we know, they eventually called out for his crucifixion. And so there on the right hand side, we have a later period, not much later, where in John's Gospel, he describes how the Jewish people actually cried out for the crucifixion of Jesus. They cried out concerning Jesus, away with him, away with him, crucify him. The Roman governor, Pilate, said, shall I crucify your king? He was called that in the Old Testament. We looked at that in Psalm 48. The chief priests, now note that, the chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. They refused to recognise that Jesus was their king, promised to them in the Old Testament. So Pilate handed Jesus over to be crucified. Now, not long before that, Jesus had actually uttered a warning to the Jewish people. We read that tonight in Luke chapter 21. And this is the warning. When you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those in the city get out and let those in the country not enter the city. So Jesus warned the people of his day that because of their wickedness, because the fact that they had rejected the Son of God, then Jesus knew that a time of punishment was coming upon them. And although it didn't happen straight away, in fact, the, the destruction of the city of Jerusalem did not take place until about 40 years after Jesus uttered these words. But the fact is, it happened. In AD 70, the Roman armies came down into uh, Israel and they besieged the city of Jerusalem. Jesus said that Jerusalem would be trampled underfoot. Jerusalem would be attacked, destroyed, and it would lay in ruins for a long time. And uh, we don't have to doubt the historical facts. You don't have to turn to the Bible to read about the sacking of Jerusalem in AD 70. You can turn to many historical accounts which tell us that the Romans attacked the city in AD 70. They destroyed it. And uh, most uh, significantly, they destroyed the temple, their central place of worship. It has been recorded that um, the Roman soldiers, they wanted to get all the treasures out of the temple. And so to get at the gold that was there, they tore all the stones apart. So all the stones of the temple were pulled apart, thrown down. There wasn't one stone left standing. The whole temple was totally and utterly destroyed, just as Jesus had predicted. Now, if you go to Jerusalem today, you go to a place which is known as the, the Wailing Wall or the Western Wall, and it's a huge structure, 
very made up of very big stones carved out of the rock surrounding Jerusalem. And sometimes you might think, well, I thought Jesus said that the temple would be totally destroyed and there wouldn't be one stone left upon another. And yet here we are at the Western Wall, and it's a huge wall, so was the prophecy incorrect? Well, no, it wasn't incorrect, you see, because the Western Wall that is there today is not the original temple, it's just the foundation structure upon which, on a smooth plateau-type area, the temple was built. So the actual temple itself was totally destroyed, but the foundation wall which enabled the uh, Jewish people to build up the land surface to build the temple, well, that's still there, but that wasn't part of the temple. So Jesus said they'd be led away captive into all nations. And once again, history testifies to that fact. So what I'm giving you initially tonight is a little bit of a history of the city of Jerusalem, how it came about in the first place, and what happened to it. Now, after the invasion by the Romans, um, a few years later, a magnificent stone arch was built and it's still there today in the city of Rome. It's called the Arch of Titus because Titus was the, the Roman general that was involved in the sacking of Jerusalem. And Jesus said Jerusalem would be trodden down. And you can go to that arch today and you can see inscribed on the insides of the arch, a depiction of the Romans taking away to Rome what they had captured from the temple, the seven branch candlestick and other notable features of the temple. So that's that, uh, uh, I'm trying to think what you call it, uh, engraving, say, that engraving inside the arch of the, the Arch of Titus that's an actual photograph of what is inside the arch. It depicts the leaders of Israel being taken captive along with many of the riches and the, the beautiful furniture of the temple. Now the amazing thing is this. As I said, you can go to the city of Rome today and that arch is there. It's been standing there for over 1900 years. A magnificent structure. And yet we ask the question, where is the Roman Empire? It doesn't exist. Yes, there is the Italian nation, and they have a government, but you know, the, the nation of Italy today is just nothing compared to the mighty Roman Empire of 2,000 years ago. It's just nothing. And God made a promise that although the Jewish people would be taken captive, they would never, ever be completely destroyed. Well, they were scattered. And there on the map is a, di a diagram depicting the scattering of the Jewish people from the area of Palestine from the year AD 70, when the Romans attacked the area, right through to AD 500. Of course, since AD 500, the Jewish people have been scattered even more. And that's why Jews are found in all parts of the world. It was just a complete total scattering of the Jewish people. And their once favoured and beloved homeland of Palestine, or the Promised Land, perhaps would be a better way of describing it, was no longer inhabited by Jewish people, except, I suppose you could say, just a few here and there, a remnant that held out as very poor people in the land. And talking of the scattering, here's an artist's depiction of Jews fleeing a pogrom in Russia. And what I'd like you to note is this, that when the Jews were scattered, it wasn't just that they were scattered into all parts of the world and then they settled down and lived a comfortable life and they, they got on with everyone and they became assimilated into the business of the country. They became accepted by all the residents. That wasn't the case, you see. Except in very few places, wherever the Jews went, they were disliked, they were hated, they were accused of being responsible for all the misfortunes that came upon their host nation. So if there was a famine or a flood or a disease or unexplained deaths of people in a city, the Jews would be blamed. And from time to time, especially in the, 
to the nation of Russia, there were what was called pogroms. These pogroms were organised vicious attacks upon Jews living in villages where people would just rampage through the city and murder whoever they felt like and ransack their houses and steal everything. And this was a government sanctioned thing. It wasn't as though it was something just decided by the people and the government wasn't involved. The government sanctioned these pogroms. They liked their people to take out their wrath and envy against the Jews. So from the time they were scattered in AD 70, right through to the late 19th century, and even beyond, I suppose you could say, Jews all around the world on a regular basis would hold little religious services in their homes, they'd gather around the table and Father would tell them all about the grand past of Jerusalem and how the Jerusalem was once a beautiful city and how the Jews were once favoured by God and how David ruled over them as a king. And they'd light a candle and the Father would pray and say to his family, next year in Jerusalem, and you know, that sort of prayer was kept up by the Jewish people year in, year out, for hundreds of years. They always dreamt that one day they would get back into Jerusalem. Centuries rolled by, century after century, and it never seemed possible that they would get back to the Promised Land. Now here's a quotation from Jeremiah. Behold, says God, I will send for many fishes. So God predicted a time would come when the Jews would be asked, would be drawn back into their land. A time would come when things would start to change. And instead of the Jewish people being kept out of Palestine, the time would come when they would gradually be drawn back to the land. And so initially, fishes were sent. God says in Ezekiel, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. Now I want you to notice that when God says he's going to bring them back into Israel, he doesn't say I'm just going to bring them back into a land that they can dwell and once again um, become prosperous. He says I'm going to bring them back into their own land. You know, all around the world today, there are constant discussions held in the United Nations in New York City and in the world press and uh, world leaders of every nation will always be discussing the issue as to who really owns that land of what is known today as Palestine. Well, who owns it? God said 2,600 years ago, the Jews own it. Not because they just decided to own it, they own it because God gave it to them. You see, God really owns the land. But God said to the Jewish people, I will give you that land. That is my gift to you, so long as you are obedient and serve me in truth. So God was, through the prophet Ezekiel, foretelling a time when they would come back to that land that God had given to them. All right, now we move forward to the year 1897. And uh, on the 29th of August, 1897, was uh, a very important congress or a, a meeting held in Baal, Switzerland. And that meeting was known as the First Zionist Congress on the 29th of August, 1897. And the man that organised that congress was a Jewish, uh, a German Jewish man called Theodor Herzl. And he was fervently involved in trying to persuade the Jewish people that they had to get back to their promised land. He wasn't a particularly religious man, but he fervently believed that the area where the Jews once lived and from which David once reigned at Jerusalem, it belonged to the Jewish people. And the resolution passed at that Congress was this, to establish a home for the Jewish people in Palestine secured under public law. Now you just think about this. The city of Jerusalem was sacked in AD 70. The Jews were scattered into all parts of the world. For centuries they kept praying, next year in Jerusalem. And the years rolled by and nothing happened. 
And yet God had promised in Ezekiel 37 that one day they would go back to their own land. And then 1800 years after the sacking of Jerusalem, this congress of Jewish people was held in Switzerland. And they decide that they want to establish a home for the Jewish people in Palestine. Now at the time, Palestine was under the control of the Turkish people. But in the First World War, the Turks were against the Allied forces of Great Britain and Australia and New Zealand. And the end result of uh, the Turks being against Great Britain and her allies was that the Turkish people, or the Turkish army, was defeated. And so whereas they had occupied Palestine and controlled Jerusalem for over 400 years, suddenly the Turkish people found that they were going to lose that territory. Theodore Herzl made this wonderful statement. Were I to sum up the Baal Conference, Congress in a word, which I shall guard against pronouncing publicly, it would be this. So what was, what was Theodore Herzl's prediction about the outcome of that Congress? He said this, at Baal, I founded the Jewish state. Now that's a bold statement, isn't it? I founded the Jewish state when it was occupied by the Turkish government and had been for 400 years. And yet he says, I founded the Jewish state. If I said this out loud today, I would be answered by universal laughter. But he says, perhaps in five years, certainly in 50 years, everyone will know that this statement of mine will be true. He wasn't a religious man. This is not God speaking to people through three little hurts. This was just his dream. This was just his desire. And yet, you know, remarkably, he was accurate almost to the day. So we go back, we'll go forward now, sorry, to 1917, a hundred years ago, 1917. So what happened then? Well, firstly, the British government issued a very famous declaration called the Balfour Declaration. In that declaration, the British government said that they were very favourably disposed to helping the Jewish people establish a home for themselves in Palestine. Can you imagine how the Jewish people would have thought, or what they would have thought when they received that letter? How would you think? Your people have been scattered all around the world for 1900 years. The land had been occupied and controlled by the Ottoman Turks for 400 years. On the 3rd of November 1917, or 2nd of November, sorry, in 1917, when the British Foreign Office uttered this statement in giving, giving the okay for the Jewish people to go back to the land, at that stage the British army hadn't even conquered the, the Ottoman Turks. They had just captured, effectively, one city, and that was Beersheba. All the rest of the land had yet to be conquered by the British, and yet the British government was confident enough to say, we will allow the Jewish people to go back. And then just over a month later, the general in, in control of the siege against the Turks, General Allenby, he marched into Jerusalem on the uh, 11th of December, 1917. The city was captured by the army on the 9th of December, but the official taking of the city was when General Allenby walked into the city on the 11th of December. Now, you remember I said earlier that, that uh, Psalm 48 said that Jerusalem was the city of the great king. General Allenby, in charge of the British forces, was a man that knew his Bible. And surprisingly, so also did the British cabinet. Many of the British cabinet members were very religious men and they knew their Bible. And they knew that one day a Jewish king would ride into Jerusalem. Allenby knew that. And so when he came to the gates of Jerusalem, he deliberately, as instructed by the British cabinet, got off his horse and he walked into Jerusalem, as you can see him there. He walked in. And the reason being is, it's not for him to ride into Jerusalem that that magnificent act is reserved for the future king. 
So he wouldn't ride in. He walked in. And you can see there from the newspaper heading, Jerusalem rescued by the British after 673 years of Muslim rule. Now I thought it was 400, so I was about 50% out. But um, anyway, it was a long time, wasn't it? All right, so the British have captured Jerusalem and later on they were able to conquer the whole territory of Palestine and take it from the Turks. The Jewish people then worldwide were allowed to go back to their land. But uh, it wasn't long before a very terrible menace against the Jewish people developed in Nazi Germany. And Adolf Hitler made it very plain, not only in writing but also in his statements, that he wanted to annihilate the Jewish people. And uh, on the 20th of January 1942, a very important meeting was held in a suburb of Berlin by Lake Wannsee. And in a, a quite a nice building in Wannsee, a meeting was held amongst uh, some very important high-ranking army men, government men of Hitler's Nazi party. SS official Reinhard Heydrich held the meeting of Nazi government officials to present the final solution. What was the final solution? It was a meeting held to decide how they would destroy every living Jewish person in all of Europe, including Russia. At this meeting, known as the Wannsee Conference, the Nazi officials agreed to SS plans for the transport and destruction of all 11 million Jews of Europe. The Nazis would use the latest in 20th century technology, cost-efficient engineering and mass production techniques for the sole purpose of killing off the following racial groups, Jews, Russian prisoners of war and gypsies. Their long-range plans, unrealised, included targeting some 30 million Slavs for death. And on the right-hand side we have written in uh, German, the various nations of Europe with the estimated number of Jewish people living in those nations. And although we can't read uh, all of the German words, but the, the fourth name down is called the General Government, and that was a territory which was once part of Poland. And in 1942, there were still 2.2 million Jews living in that area. Uh, we go down to Germany and there were about 700,000 there. England even, they were going to, they thought, destroy the British army and therefore they would be able to kill the 330,000 living there. Romania had 342. But look down the bottom, the USSR, the old name for Russia and her satellite nations, 5 million Jews, 11 million in total. And if Germany had been successful and had been able to defeat the British army in the Middle East, they would also have destroyed every living Jew in Palestine. That was the, that was the dream of Hitler. But we can't forget, can we, the promise made by God. God said, I'll bring them back to their own land. And uh, we have to remember that. So after Germany was defeated in World War II, there was a lot of sympathy for the Jewish people. They had suffered terribly in the Holocaust. Six million Jews perished at the hands of Nazi Germany. So in 1947, the United Nations held a meeting. And on the 29th of November 1947, the outcome of this special meeting to decide what to do with Palestine was, was this, that they decided to divide Palestine into an Arab state and an Israeli state, and it was approved by more than a two-thirds majority. And down the bottom you have the map, the, uh, the sort of the pinkish area was the territory allocated to the Jewish people, and the green area, now is that right? No, no, the green area was the territory allocated for the Jewish people, and the pinkish area was that allocated to the Arabs. Now what I want you to notice is that as far as Jerusalem was concerned, the United Nations said that it would belong to neither side. It would be known as an international city. So let's just think again. Jerusalem was first occupied or first conquered by David and his army 1000 BC. 
then about 500 years later it was destroyed by the Babylonians. The Jewish people came back and they rebuilt their city and the temple and then in AD 70 the Romans destroyed the city and the Jews were scattered. Now we're looking at 1900 years later and the Jews when they heard that the United Nations were going to divide up the land they may have thought to themselves well are we going to get Jerusalem? No they didn't get it. But I suppose they were thankful that neither did the Arabs. It was to be an international city. I want you to just look at these words taken from the prophecy of Ezekiel in chapter 37. Ezekiel had a vision of a valley of dry bones. And they were so dry that they could never live again by human hands. And yet Ezekiel was asked, Ezekiel, do you think that these bones can live? And Ezekiel wasn't game enough to give an answer. He said, Lord God, you know the answer to that. How can I answer that? And God told him, yes, they are going to live. And even though you think that your hope is lost because of the scattering of the Jews all around the world, God said this in verse 12. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves. So there was the promise. They were going to come back to their land. Only six months after the United Nations resolution, David Ben-Gurion, as the first Prime Minister of the modern state of Israel, stood up in a building in Tel Aviv on the 14th of May 1948 and proclaimed the revival of the Jewish state of Israel. Israel. The, the New York Times said it was the first Hebrew nation in 2,000 years. Well, probably not quite right, but anyway, it was close to it. Now, the day after that proclamation was made, the Arabs attacked the new fledgling state of Israel. They not only attacked Israel, but they said to the Arab people, just relax, we will defeat the Jews conclusively. And all the Jews will be thrown into the Mediterranean. And you can then just walk in and take their land. So that took place a day after the Jewish state of Israel was proclaimed. Well, after many months of fighting, a uh, ceasefire was proclaimed. The Arabs did not succeed in throwing the Jews into the Mediterranean. And in fact, the Israeli people were able to take control of much more land than had been allocated to them by the United Nations. But what I'd like you to notice is this, that as far as Jerusalem was concerned, now it's no longer an international city because the Jordanians captured the West Bank. Now that was supposed to be given to a new Arab state, but the Jordanians said, no, we'll take it. And not only did they take the West Bank, but they also took the whole city, well, the, the, the old city, of Jerusalem. And even though in the armistice agreement that was signed in 1949, Jordan was supposed to set up a special committee to work out who was going to rule Jerusalem, the Jordanians refused. And for the next 19 years, from 1948 to 1967, the Jordanians occupied Jerusalem, that is the old city. And the Jews, no Jew, was allowed into the old city of Jerusalem. So now we're getting close to 50 years ago, 1967, the Battle for Jerusalem. It's called the Six Day War. Six days because it was all over and done with in six days. Now, when the battle started, the Israeli Prime Minister and the army said to the Jordanians, now look, stay out of this war. We don't want to fight with you. We've got enemies, but we have got really no axe to grind with you, so stay out of the war. The Jordanians wouldn't listen. They said, no, we're part of the Arab team, we're coming into the war. So because Jordan came into the war, Israel was forced to fight Jordan, and in the course of that battle, they captured the old city of Jerusalem. They moved in to try and capture the city on the 6th of June, and a day later, on the 7th of June, the capture of the old city of Jerusalem was completed. Now, I'd just like to tell you something like a personal history for me, and that is this, that um, 
At this time, 50 years ago, I was due to give a talk at um, the Warradale Community Centre, I suppose you call it, just by the Warradale Station. Um, oh, we were having lectures there every Sunday night in preparation for starting an ecclesia. And it was my lot to actually give a talk on the Sunday night when all this was happening. And I remember Uncle Max Lund ringing me up and saying, now look, you're down to speak on Sunday night to the subject, whatever it was, you know, you'll never go to hell or something like that. Uh, a fairly sort of basic subject which they gave to beginners. And uh, he said, we're pulling you off that title and you're going to speak about this six-day war. And I thought, wow, well, I haven't spoken to this sort of subject. He says, well, you're in it, son. You're giving the talk. So I did it, and I, I must admit, it really gave me a thrill to speak to that subject. And, and I think it's so interesting. And I, who would have thought this? It's almost like a, a Theodore Herzl pronouncement. Who would have thought that 50 years later, here I am, under the auspices of the Cumberland Ecclesia, talking once again about the Six-Day War. It's just a remarkable thing. You know, many things have gone by in 50 years. I've seen Bruce Gerd go from a, a, a big man to a... To, I, I really need my, my magnifying glass on to see. Many things have happened in six days. I remember Pete Weller at his, um, at his kitchen tea evening. He was a young man with a mop of black hair. <laughs> Look what's happened in 50 years. What did you have? <laughs> <laughs> and we look, I could talk all night about what's happened in 50 years. Also, another interesting thing, you might you may already know this, but uh, I was also married in 1967, uh, not long before the war. In fact, it's always... <laughs> I often say I was married in February 1967 and shortly after that there was the war. <laughs> anyway, time's running out. I could say more about Pete Weller but I'll, I'll leave it to another night. Uh, do you know Pete Weller used to drive around in a, about a 19... I don't know, about a 1946... Uh, was it a Singer Roadster? <laughs> <laughs> His dad got up at the kitchen too. Sorry, his father-in-law got up, Uncle Art, and he was giving a talk about Pete Weller. And he said, you know, when Peter was a younger man, he used to like something a bit sporty. And he was referring to his singer, Roadster, like a mini sports car, but could only do about 50 miles an hour, flat out. So then he said, as, as he developed, he, he got rid of the sporty sort of uh, way of life, and he settled down for something more serviceable, and the more serviceable was Shirley. So <laughs> she's not a sporty type, she's more serviceable. <laughs> right, so after 1900 years, here is the Israeli army, this is the actual shot of the army. You know, for many months I could only get a black and white picture of this, but I stumbled across this coloured one, and it was fantastic. There is the army of Israel, there ready to move in on the 6th of June. It's a great shot because there in front of them is the old city of Jerusalem. After 1900 years, it's within their grasp. And then the next day, there's great excitement. You have the army generals moving in, the IDF, the Israeli Defence Forces, liberated Jerusalem. They said, we've got back to the city and it's ours, never to part from it again. And then you have a picture of the army emotionally uh, crying, weeping at the western wall, the foundation of the old temple. And then on the right you have the, uh, the Israeli rabbi, the military rabbi, Harav Goren, blowing the shofar, the trumpet, to celebrate this magnificent victory, incredible victory, 40 years after the British had captured the city in... No, 50 years after the British had captured the city in 1917. Here's a little comment... Uh, given by the mayor, the current mayor of Jerusalem. He said, when the city was captured, my family and I went out to walk the streets of our newly reunited city. I saw the adults around me crying. As a child, I couldn't understand. Only years later did I realise the source of that outpouring of emotion. 
In that moment, we fulfilled a 2,000 year old dream. We returned to the roots of our history, the city of David, the Temple Mount, the Mount of Olives, and the Western Wall. We united east and west, north and south. Jerusalem's unity has strengthened us all. And I think when you, when you read emotional comments like that, you get a bit of an idea as to why the Jews will not, will not divide that city again. They've got the whole city. They've got the new city and they've got the old. And they're saying to the world, you can't take that city away from us. It's our city. It is where our great King David reigned from. And uh, there's that famous picture there on the right-hand side of those three soldiers. One's got his helmet off and he's looking at the wall and you can almost feel him saying, I can't believe this, that we have got this city. And there on the left-hand side is the map. And so you can see the old city of Jerusalem. It's not very big, but it means everything to the Jewish people. Well, there's the outcome of the Six-Day War. Many magazines highlighted the incredible victory. And on the right-hand side, you've got the territory that Israel gained in brown, or whatever like colour you like to call it. They got all of Jerusalem, they got the West Bank, they got the Golan Heights, and they got Egypt and Gaza. Well, since then, they've given Sinai back to Egypt, they've given Gaza back to the Palestinians, but they've kept Jerusalem, and they've kept the Golan Heights, and currently the West Bank is a territory under, you might say, administration. They haven't annexed it. So where do we go from here? It's 50 years since the Jews captured that city. What's next? 50 years since the reunification of Jerusalem. 50 years is very significant in the Bible. It's called a Jubilee year. And it signifies a period of release, of happiness. A time when everyone rejoices in what God has given to them. And there you have... Um, a man blowing the ram's horn to celebrate 50 years. And uh, on the right-hand side, you have an old photograph of the Jewish rabbi blowing the horn in 1967. So we're looking at some significant times, aren't we? A hundred years ago, the British captured Jerusalem from the Turks. In 1967, the Israelis captured the city from the Jordanians. And then 2017, it's the 50th anniversary and also the 100th anniversary since 1917. So I've been told, and I picked this up from the internet, that the original Balfour Declaration is going to be displayed in Israel this year. That's something really exciting. So what does this mean to us? Well, the Lord said in Luke 21, as we read this evening, Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles, that is, the non-Jewish people, until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And Jesus said, I tell you that this generation will not pass away until all these prophecies have been fulfilled. And that statement by Jesus has been very, um, it, it's, it's sort of arrested our interest, hasn't it? Year in, year out. What is the generation that will not pass away? Let's just digress for a moment. In the Bible, Israel is depicted as a fig tree. So whatever happens to Israel is described in fig tree terms. So Matthew 24. Now learn the parable from the fig tree, he said. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know the summer is near. So you too, when you see these things, see what things? See the re-establishment of the state of Israel on 14th of May 1948. See the capture of Jerusalem by the Jews on the 7th of June, 1967. When you see these things, know that Jesus Christ's return to the earth is near. So we are living in really significant times. 50 years for us is a long time, isn't it? But to God, 50 years is nothing. It's just like a second in time. Very exciting things are going to happen. And 2017, well, we're halfway through. What's going to happen? I can't tell you. In the Bible, Jerusalem is described as a burdensome stone. Now, what that means is that whenever nations try and solve the Jewish problem, that is, who owns Jerusalem, it becomes something so burdensome, so difficult, 
but they can't arrive at a solution. And this burdensome stone concept of Jerusalem is going to keep going until the Battle of Armageddon. And in the Bible we have depicted very clearly the end siege of Jerusalem. The Prime Minister of Israel was right when he said, after nearly 4,000 years of Jewish history, inextricably tied to this land, almost 100 years after the Balfour Declaration, well it is 100 years now, 68 years after the establishment of the State of Israel, there are people who still deny our strong connection to the land. So that's why Jerusalem is a burdensome stone. It doesn't matter what Israel does, the nations of the world will not accept her status as being in that land. So that is why Zechariah said, in that day, says God, I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with Jerusalem shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. What do you think Russia's next move will be? Russia is a very powerful nation. And the Bible makes it very clear in Ezekiel 38 that a time is coming when Russia, together with all those other nations depicted there in red, will move against Israel. Why will they move against Israel? Well, the Bible says to take a spoil, to take a prey. And some of that spoil could well be the holy sites that are in Jerusalem. Do you know that a lot of the real estate in Jerusalem, a lot of the holy sites, are Russian Orthodox Church possessions? And I can well imagine the time fast approaching when the church, in cahoots with the Soviet, or not the Soviet, the Russian army, shall go into Israel. And it's most interesting, isn't it, that in the prophecy of Joel, in the net version, that invasion is described as a holy war. Proclaim this among the Gentiles. Prepare for a holy war. Call out the warriors. Let all these fighting men approach and attack. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I too am a warrior. So when it says there's going to be a holy war, I can foresee the church in connection with the Russian forces cooperating to make sure they get what they want in Jerusalem. Here's a mock paper headline. This is not real. It's almost like that um, film or play, wasn't it, by Orson Welles, War of the Worlds. Uh, way back in the 40s, I think, in the 1940s in the USA, they had a play on the radio station and it was about a great battle was taking place in the world and the people listening to the play were so alarmed they thought it was real and it just about freaked all the US citizens out of their socks. Now, so I'm just telling you, this one on the left is a mock title. But nevertheless, you can imagine the papers recording this invasion of Israel and the attack on Jerusalem. Jerusalem falls, Russian intentions clearly show as city is pillaged, inhabitants take captive prayer vigil by desperate Jews. Well, what does Zechariah say? For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. But when the nations invade Israel and try and destroy Jerusalem, that is when God says, that's enough. I know my people have been wicked. I know they deserve judgment but they don't deserve annihilation. And they're not going to be annihilated, says God. He who touches Israel touches the apple of my eye, and God will roar out of Jerusalem and utter his voice, and the world will shake when they feel the force of the God of Israel. And it shall come to pass in that day, says God, that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And after that mighty battle of Armageddon, what do you think is going to happen to Jerusalem? It shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king. Remember Psalm 48? The city of the great king, Jesus, reigning on behalf of the Lord of hosts and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So it's no wonder we should be keeping our eyes on Israel in 2017. And no wonder 
we feel the effect of Isaiah 43, where God said that the Jews are God's witnesses. So whatever happens to the Jews, whether they're attacked, whether their city is destroyed, whether they're scattered into all parts of the world, whether they come back to their land, whether they recapture the city of Jerusalem, whether they're going to be invaded again, all of these things are witnesses to the fact that God exists. Now I'm just going to take you back to that thought, this generation shall not pass away. What is a generation? In Psalm 90 we have these words. The days of our years are three score. Well that's 70. Sorry, that's six. Three score years and ten. <coughs> I almost thought I had to go back to Blackwood High School with John Sidia. Now, and if by reason of strength they be four score years, well that's eighty years, yet is their strength labour and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. So, what's the generation? Here's a thought. 1947, the UN resolution. 1948, the State of Israel. 70 years from there is now and next year. If you extend it to 80 years, it puts us through to 2027, 2028. Just a thought. There has to be an explanation for that statement by Jesus that this generation shall not pass away. I think the discussion point has always been where do you start the generation from? That's the interesting question, isn't it? The bigger question is, are we ready for the coming of Christ? And I will make them one nation, says God, in the land, and one king shall be king to them all, and I will cleanse them. And we know that in Jerusalem, when it's elevated... Beautiful for situation in Psalm 48. It will be an elevated city. The great temple depicted in Ezekiel's prophecy will be built and it will be a house of prayer for all peoples. And in that day, the Jewish people won't be hated like they are today. They will be loved and respected. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, It shall yet come to pass that there shall come people and the inhabitants of many cities and the inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go speedily to pray before the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will go also. Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts. In those days it shall come to pass that ten men, and the number ten in the Bible represents everything. It's a representative number. So effectively... Zechariah is saying people from all around the world, represented by the ten men, shall take hold out of all languages of the nations. And you can feel the build-up in this. You see, Zechariah is not telling you straight away. Ten men of all languages of the nations shall take hold, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is an Israelite. He doesn't say that. He uses this despised name all around the world. How do you think the Jewish people are looked upon all around the world today? With very little favour by any nation. The name Jew is a name that represents hatred, persecution, holocaust. But God says the day is coming when people all around the world shall go up to someone who once was a hated Jew. And they'll say to that Jew, do you know what? We want to go with you to Jerusalem. And we want to worship God there in Jerusalem. For we have heard, we have heard that the God of all the earth is with you, of all people. You. What a fantastic quotation that is. Good news. Jerusalem, centre of conflict, yes, but centre of peace. And the final message for us tonight is pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love you. So that's the history and the future around June 1967.